I want to talk today about bullying. Bullying has been a major part of my life, major part of what makes me who I am today, simply because I was bullied severely in middle school and junior high. Where I went to school, it was separated into, there was elementary school, there was intermediate school, which was fifth and sixth. They added fourth grade a little bit later. Uh, and then there's junior high, which was 7th and 8th, and then high school, which was 9th through 12th. So when I say middle school, I mean from like 4th grade through 8th grade. I was bullied severely in school, and I wanted to start this off by relaying my story and then going into some of some other information around bullying. I After school, let me start with intermediate school, 6th grade. We had to go to uh, work on a group project for school. Uh, we were doing this World's Fair thing, and uh, the teacher put us into groups. And so we had to go over to one of our classmates' houses outside of school hours and work on the project. Well, I went to the house of this um, classmate, and we got done with the school project early. So we decided to go into his backyard and play until it was time to go home. Uh, my mom had to work that day, and so when she dropped me off, uh, she asked the uh, kid's dad if he could give me a ride home, and he said, yeah, sure. So anyway, after we were done, we went into the backyard and we played, and it was about that time that the other two guys in my group decided to gang up on me. They tied me up with a jump rope, put me on this play school slide. It was a little bit bigger than your average play school slide. But they sat me down on it. The one whose house we were at came running, charging at me, full force, slammed into me, knocked me over, and I snapped my collarbone to where it was like this. Now, we didn't know at the time that that's what had happened. All I knew was I was in an exorbitant amount of pain. I couldn't move. I, I tried to get up. I couldn't get up. His father came running out. Uh, see what was going on, found me on the ground, tried to help me up. I, I couldn't get up because I was in so much pain. After about a minute of him trying to help me up, he says, well, I'm not going to wait out here for you forever. When you're ready, go ahead and get up, come inside. We'll be waiting for you, and then I'll take you home. I laid out there on the ground for probably around half an hour, maybe more. I'm not entirely sure, but I do know it was a, at least half an hour. No one came to check on me or anything. Eventually, my arm and shoulder just went numb because not only of how I was laying, but the pain was just so constant and intolerable. I guess my nerves just kind of gave out. So I was able to finally pull myself up, went inside. They were all around the table playing a game or something, laughing and carrying on and stuff. And I asked if they could take me home. They're like, yeah, in a minute. They weren't in any big hurry. Well, eventually they took me home and dropped me off. My mom was at work. This was in the 90s, so we were all latchkey kids at that time. I had been holding my arm like this the entire time trying to keep it from moving because even moving it an inch just hurt if you've ever broken your collarbone you you know so he dropped me off and i went inside i tried to sit on the couch but leaning back made it hurt even more so i set some pillows down in front of the couch and i sat that i kind of slowly lowered myself down onto him. And I sat with my back propped up against the couch, holding my arm like this, just crying. Because about that time, my nerves had woken back up. And I was in so much pain. I sat there for about two hours before my mom came home from work. She found me there, just crying in so much pain. She asked me what, what what was wrong, and I told her what happened. So she took me to the ER. They took x-rays, and the x-rays showed my collarbone was like this. She cussed that father out royally. The next day is, is I think, a Sunday or something like that. 
The next day, he brought me some McDonald's. Like, that was going to make up for it. At school that week, we, we had this thing where each week, somebody from one of the students would be the uh, office runner, running the attendance to the office. This was before every classroom had a phone and everything. Run the attendance to the office and stuff like that. This is my week to do it. But the teacher skipped over me. And I was like, wait a minute, it, it, it's my turn to run to the office. It got us out of class, you know. So everyone looked forward to their week. And she's like, no, I'm not taking the chance. I don't want you falling or something happening to you and you blaming the school. It's like, what the hell, you know? My sixth grade teacher was a real piece of work. She was just as big of a bully as the rest of my class. I had her two years in a row because I got held back in sixth grade. Because that was the year that I just stopped caring. I was bullied so relentlessly in fifth grade and both years of sixth grade and everything. I gradually just stopped caring. I put forth very little effort and nothing I did ever made things any better. So I just stopped. In junior high, I would walk to the library after school. The library was about a mile away from the high school which the junior high and high school were in the same building, just different parts of the building. And walking to the library after school, uh, some days I would just leave the school and go straight to the library. And on those days, a group of boys would chase after me. They, they, they were riding their bicycles. They would chase after me as I was on foot, and they would try to run me over. They would hit me. They would kick me. They would smack me with sticks, spit on me. Eventually, they would jump off their bikes and just beat the shit out of me. This went on for quite a while. I tried to just wait at the school after school let out in hopes that they would already be gone um, by the time I left to go to the library. But it turns out they were waiting at school for me. And they would chase me through the entire school, through the junior high, through the high school, up, upstairs, downstairs, everywhere. It didn't help. At a school dance, the this group of boys, we had the school dance in the small gym, which back in those days, the classes were divided in the small gym. You had the boys' side and then the girls' side. And there was a curtain that could be pulled to uh, separate both sides of the gym as like a large vinyl type curtain. And for the school dance, they had the curtain pulled against the wall. And this group of boys, they caught me at the school dance and they shoved me behind this curtain so that none of the chaperones could see. And they stayed on the outside of the curtain and had me trapped inside the curtain, holding both sides of the curtain closed so I couldn't escape. And they would kick me from outside the curtain. They would elbow me, punch me. This went on for, I don't even know how long. I lost track of time. There was another time at another school dance uh, that took place in the cafeteria. It was a Valentine's Day dance, I think. One guy, every time he saw me at this school dance, he punched me in the head, not in the face, in, in the head. When my mom picked me up from the school dance, I told her that I had a headache, uh, that it hurt really bad. She asked me what happened. And I said, well, the, told her this guy kept punching me at the school dance. She took me to the ER. I had a concussion. I could not go to sleep at all that night because my mom was worried that, you know, you're not supposed to sleep with a concussion. Uh, for at least the first 24 hours of concussion. Uh, otherwise, you, you could die. Uh, that was the belief back then. I'm not sure if that's still a thing or not. These situations, these events, they, they traumatized me. Along with other things that happened um, at home with my parents and stuff like that. Contributed to the traumatization. I wasn't abused per se at home. My dad uh, cheated on my mom when I was two, almost three, uh, and moved out. For And then uh, we, my mom and I moved in with my grandparents, and we shared a room. She was about to give birth to my brother, and 
when she did give birth to my brother, uh, she turned a drawer in her dresser into a makeshift crib for him. We, it was a 1970s style mobile home, you know, very small. But I rarely saw my dad after that, maybe one or two times a year. Uh, it really, that contributed to my traumatization as a child as well. I mean, the fact that I was getting bullied and I didn't have a dad to lean on to show me how to defend myself and all this, um, it didn't make things better. And so when I got to high school, we, we moved at, uh, right before I started my freshman year of high school. And I decided that I wasn't going to go through that kind of trauma again. So I decided to change my appearance to, in my mind, I wanted to scare people away so that they wouldn't have the opportunity to bully me, to physically bully me. They could still say things, you know. So that's when I went goth. And I also, be, my freshman year of high school, I became a cutter. I would break pencil sharpeners and use the razor blades and just cut up my arms. I did it openly. At first, it started out as a way of showing people, hey, if I'm willing to do this to myself, there's nothing you can do that's going to really affect me, you know. But then it kind of became an addiction almost. Not really an addiction. It gave me the same feelings as an addiction, getting a fix, you know. E eventually, I stopped. Because I realized that if I didn't stop, I was going to do irreparable damage. So that was the effects that bullying had on me. And as a substitute teacher, I haven't really seen a lot of bullying in school. Usually, students kind of keep it on the down low. Yesterday, though, I did see some bullying. Um, I subbed for a high school English class at my usual school that I sub for. After everyone got their work done and everything, they were talking. And one girl in front of the desk, my desk, was talking, turned around talking to a girl behind her. And across the room, these girls kind of speak very loudly towards her, saying, does it look like she wants to talk to you? And I, was, I look up and I'm just like, what, what's going on? And they're going back and forth, you know. These girls were just saying, no, does it really look like she wants to talk to you? And this other girl's like, well, she's talking to me. She's listening and everything. And they're just going back and forth. And I I, I stopped the situation before it progressed any further. And I called the two girl, first two girls out into the hall. And I talked to them. And told them that I don't allow bullying whatsoever in my classes. Um, this was their only warning. And if it happened again, they were going to the office. I don't know if the office does, any, did it, does anything about it when a sub sends students in there. What? And then later on, I tried to have the girl who was being bullied stay after class. But... Um, is the last class of the day and she had to leave as soon as class let out. So I kind of pulled her aside and I asked her if she was okay. Um, if she needed to go to the office or anything. And she said, no, usually they don't bully me like that. And I'm, I, I was relaying the story to my wife when I got home and she made a good point. Most of the time when bullying happens, it's never a one-time thing. If you realize that somebody is bullying you, chances are they've been bullying you all along. They've just been doing it low-key. So it really got me... Th I left a note for the regular teacher explaining what happened and everything. And I asked my wife if she thought I should email the principal of the school um, to let him know what happened and to share that I, I thought I had no evidence, but I th very strongly thought that this girl was being low-key bullied at the school. Um, 
that she didn't may not realize that she was being bullied. Uh, she, she's a student that goes to um, re the resource room to do schoolwork and stuff like that. And um, so I'm not sure what the situation is, what her IEP is or anything like that. But low-key bullying does happen. And a lot of times, especially those of us who are autistic, we don't realize we're being bullied. At least not right away. For me, there were a lot of instances that I didn't talk about in this video where I was low-key bullied and I didn't realize that I was being bullied until well after the fact. Sometimes it took years for me to realize that I was being bullied. And it, it's not a good feeling. It's not a great feeling at all. And to realize later on in life that I was bullied because of who I am. Because at the time of this video, I am undiagnosed autistic. I've done the research myself. I'm a psychology student. I've got degrees in psychology. I'm currently working on a master's in clinical counseling. I've done the research. I know I'm autistic. I'm currently on the wait list to have, be professionally diagnosed as autistic. And to realize that my autism is why I was bullied in school is a very hard pill to swallow, especially by teachers who should know better, whose job it is to not only teach students, but to help students, to advocate for students. My sixth grade teacher, well, actually I started with my fourth grade teacher. I think I've told the story on here. I know I've told it on TikTok, but I'm not sure if I told it on here or not. My fourth grade teacher was a bully. Old, older lady. Uh, the first time we had to do these um, presentations on state. And I got West Virginia. And I did all the research. I created the presentation and everything. And I forgot to do one assignment. And she told me I could not present. That I would get a zero on the presentation because I did not do one assignment. And this was the day of the presentation. I was excited about doing the presentation because I had worked so hard on creating this presentation. Learning everything I could about West Virginia and everything. And she told me no, I had to go sit out in the hall. Um, we were doing the presentations in front of not only our peers, but parents and other teachers, other classes and everything. And we did it in the, the cafeteria doubled as the gym at the time. And she told me, no, I had to go sit in the hall on the steps, um, while somebody else gave my presentation. I, I was, I was distraught. I had worked so hard on this. And I was looking forward to giving this presentation. And just because I missed one assignment, she wouldn't let me give it. Later on in the school year, I, I, I may be mixing up um, when it happened throughout the school year. But at one point in the school year, I had brought the um, graphic novel, The Death of Superman, to school. Um, well, not graphic novel, the trade paperback. In fact, no. It's stored. Um, I do still have the same copy. And she, we were watching something in class. And she caught me looking at this graphic novel while a video was going on. And she took it from me. She was like, how dare I bring such repulsive material to school and this, that, and the other. Anyway, my mom went to the school and took the uh, comic back brought it back to me and told me not she was understandable you know she told me you know just don't take it back to school you know i'm not in trouble or anything just and then on the last day of school we a lot of schools do this now but back then anytime we you know did good on an assignment or did something good in class or something like that we got these reward bucks you know and on the last day of school we could trade them in or uh 
we would participate in a silent auction, you know. And on the last day, I had all these uh, reward bucks saved up. And we went around in the room and put our bid, wrote our bid on a piece of paper and put it under the item we were bidding on. I found this collection of comic books. It was like Terminator versus Robocop or something like that with a few Batman and Superman comics thrown in. I put down my entire bid, my bid of as all my money on these comic books. And when it came time, this teacher, she was like, and the winner of the comic books is so-and-so who gave a bid of such and such. And I spoke up. I was like, wait a minute. I bid more than them. Why are they getting these comics? And she was like, I didn't see your bid. I realized then and there that she had actually saw my bid, but she basically threw it away so that I wouldn't get the comics. Um, this this teacher hated me for, I don't know for what reason, but she hated me. The principal wasn't any better. Or no, the, the principal of that school was nice. The principal of the next school, the intermediate school, wasn't much better. My fifth grade teacher, she was right in the middle. She had her times when she could be a bully. But... I think she was just an old school teacher that was very strict. And you could tell she did actually care about the students and wanted to see them do well. Um, but because of her old school mentality, a lot of times she did come off as a bully. Um, and then in sixth grade, you know, that teacher. And she was actually the person who gave me the nickname that haunted me all through junior high and high school, even in the new school district that I moved to. I used to sign my papers S period Hickey, because at the time my last name was Hickey and she was returning papers and she stood up in front of the class and she was calling out names, told them to come up and get their uh, papers. And she finds mine and she goes, Shicky. Whole class roars in laughter. And I'm just like, oh shit. I go, uh, I kind of stumble up there with my head low and everything. And after that, everybody called me Shiki. And when we, when I moved to the new school district, my younger brother told my friends about that nickname. And then it started going around school and I, I couldn't escape it. There were many times that I wanted to end my life in school because I was bullied so severely. And then there were other times when I wanted to go the other route. I, I was bullied so severely in school by everybody, even people who were in my friend group bullied me. And teachers bullied me. Uh, my intermediate school principal bullied me, you know. Even on the rare times that I got to see my dad, he would bully me, call me fat, make gestures like saying that I was gay and stuff like that, teasing me, making fun of me and all this. Same with my older brother and my sister. And so I, I was at a point where I seriously, seriously considered um, we were living on our family farm um, shared the property with my grandparents who lived in the farmhouse. We lived in the mobile home. My grandparents would always leave their doors locked, unlocked, you know, because we were the only other people out there and we needed to be able to get in, feed the dogs, stuff like that whenever they were away. And I, I honestly considered going into my grandparents' house one time and getting one of my grandpa's firearms and hiding it in my backpack and taking it to school with me. That is how bad it had gotten for me. Um, I had tried getting help. I had tried going to teachers. I got a hair right there. That's kind of bugging me. I tried going to teachers, to principals. My junior high principal was really awesome. Anytime he heard that I was being bullied, 
he would help me out. He would call me and the student who was bullying me into his office and he would ream them. He would, he would make them cry by, you know, he wasn't being mean. He, he was being very authoritative and making them realize what their actions were actually doing. And, you know, he, there was one time when he was very loudly speaking to this one student who had been bullying me. And he was like, who's, who's someone uh, at the school that you wouldn't want to mess with? And the student mentioned a name of this jock, you know, very popular student who um, was always on the honor roll and stuff like that, sports teams and everything. And the principal was like, I, I know him. They're good friends with my son. Uh, what would you do if I called them into the office and asked them to treat you the way you've been treating Shannon? What if I sat, if I brought him to the office and I left the room and told him to do whatever he wanted? What would you do then? This kid left the office in tears. He he was a big bull, bully, you know. He was probably twice my size. Not weight size, but like height and muscle. And he left in tears. And I don't think he ever really said another thing about me again. I'm sorry, that hair is driving me nuts. One principal actually advocated for me. While... Teachers and other principals actually contributed to the bullying. I often wonder how I was able to resist the urge to take matters into my own hands, either by ending my life or ending theirs. And it comes down to the, my favorite person. As an autistic, we have favorite people. Uh, or a favorite person, usually. Even... Even as someone with BPD, we have a favorite person. My favorite person has always been my great-grandmother. She passed away when I was in fourth grade. And that was when things really started going downhill for me. And I always wanted to make her proud of me. Because she was my strongest supporter. You know, she, she loved me more than anything. In fact, let me show you a picture. This is a picture of me with my great-grandma. You know, she loved the fact that I was in Cub Scouts and always came to um, grandparents' day at school. Anytime I had a school activity, a school concert, or anything, she would come and cheer me on and support me and everything. And I always, always wanted to make her proud of me. And I think that's the only reason why I didn't follow through with any of these thoughts of either taking my own life or taking theirs was because I wanted my grandmother, my great grandmother to be proud of me. I didn't want to do anything that would interfere with that. Sorry, I'm getting a little peered up. But a lot of kids don't have that. So it's no wonder that they take one of those two routes. Now, I'm not saying that it's okay to do either one of those. And I don't condone either of those two routes at all. But as somebody who has experienced it and has been brought to that point, I do understand it. Got some information brought up here. Um... I did some research a few months back, and I'll put the um, references. It's just bugging the shit out of me. I'll put the references in the um, description below. But one out of every five students between the ages of 12 and 18 has experienced bullying at some point. Students who reported being bullied stated it had an impact on how other students treated them. Many children are bullied by peers who are larger or stronger than they are. Some children are bullied because they have less money than their peers. Fewer than half of all students who experience bullying in school report it to the authorities. And especially when teachers bully students, 
even though many teachers will argue that they aren't bullying the students, they just want them to do what they're told. No, they're bullying the students. By yelling at a student in front of their classmates or saying anything negative towards them in front of their classmates, they are bullying them. They are contributing to how their peers see them. Uh, students who are bullied by other students at school are more likely to develop depression. Uh, the most common signs of depression include sleep problems, appetite changes, emotional disturbances, and even thoughts of suicide. Children who experience depression may lose enjoyment in activities that once brought them happiness. Bullying can make students more likely to develop anxiety. Uh, anxiety may develop because students fear bullying at every turn. Anxiety makes it harder for people to form relationships with friends, peers, and teachers. Uh, bullying can make it harder for kids to succeed in the classroom. This can make it harder for them to keep up with their academic studies. If students are bullied regularly, they may not want to go to school or participate in school-related activities like sports or field trips. Uh, children who are bullied may see themselves as being less worthy than others. They may feel like other people are better than they are. They may believe they do not deserve to enjoy the same happiness and success as other children. Uh, this can be devastating to academic and social development and can have varying results such as loss of self-confidence, increased self-criticism, and increased uh, self-isolation. It's important for parents, educators, and other adults in supportive roles to know how to spot signs of cyberbullying and mental health issues in children and adolescents. Signs a youth may be developing serious mental health issues include random fits of anger and crying spells for no apparent reason, complaints about feelings of hopelessness and emptiness, disproportionate reactions of anger and frustration when compared to the situation, a loss of interest in activities that used to bring joy and pleasure, feelings of low self-esteem, guilt, and worthlessness difficulty focusing on and concentrating, sudden or abrupt avoidance of school and or activity uh, they used to attend. This comes from Mental Health Impact of Bullying on Kids and Teens from 2022, uh, Mass General Brigham McLean, uh, McLean Hospital. Uh, again, that link, will, that reference will be uh, another study, according to the American Psychological Association, bullying is a form of aggressive behavior in which someone intentionally or and repeatedly causes another individual injury or discomfort. Bullying is not just seen in classrooms and on playground, but it is also seen in the home, in the workplace, and online. 70.4% of school staff have seen bullying. 62% Witness bullying two or more times in the last month, and 41% witness bullying once a week or more. Mental illness and bullying have a strong correlation and can affect self esteem and lead to negative effects on an individual's mindset. The relationship between mental illness and bullying had been proven over and over again, and although treatment for mental illness remains the same, there are many ways to prevent and stop bullying before an individual is at risk of a mental health disorder. With immediate and proper mental health treatment and support systems in place, the prevention of long-term consequences associated with bullying can be minimized. Without intervention, however, kids are at risk for the following. Chronic depression, increased risk of suicidal thoughts, suicidal plans, and suicide attempts. Anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, poor general health, Self-destructive behavior, including self-harm, substance abuse, difficulty establishing trusting reciprocal friendships and relationships. Uh, this comes from Kay Fuller, 2023, Mental Illness and Bullying and Understanding the Connection uh, from Discovery Mood and Anxiety Program. I credit my the trauma I endured in childhood, whether it be from... Uh, Abandonment by my dad and the bullying I sustained anytime I did see him 
as well as the bullying I have sustained at school um, and from my siblings with the development of my borderline personality disorder. It, it has a lasting effect on people. And to say to someone that, say to an adult that they need to move on, that blaming who they are now be, on what they experienced then is childish or um, scapegoating or whatever isn't really seeing the whole picture. Our experiences make us who we are. Our experiences design and develop our personalities. When somebody experiences such severe trauma in childhood, that affects who they become in adulthood. That affects the decisions they make. That, ex that affects how they act, how they behave, um, how they communicate, how they love. To this day, I never know when somebody is giving me a genuine compliment or if they're being sarcastic. Yesterday, while I was te substitute teaching, a uh, student came up to me and she was just like, I really love your whole style. And I, I was a little confused. I, I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know if she was being sincere or if she was being sarcastic and low-key bullying. Looking at, taking a moment to look at her and seeing how she presented herself and realizing that she was being sincere. I wasn't really sure how to respond even then. Um, I was just like, what do you mean? She's like, your, your nails, your, you know, my nails, uh, which yesterday they were all green. Um, your rings, your tattoos, your bracelets, your hair, everything. I really love your style. And I, it, it took me a moment to let it set in that she wasn't being sarcastic, that she wasn't trying to bully a substitute teacher, that she was being sincere. And I, I, I just, I looked at her and then I looked away and I was just like, oh, okay, thank you exactly that way because i wasn't sure exactly how to respond to a sincere compliment even today when my wife gives me compliments i don't know how how to respond to them i don't know i know that she would never intentionally try to put me down or anything like that and so i know when anytime she gives me a compliment. She is being sincere. But because of the trauma I experienced, because of situations like that in my childhood where people would do it to mock me, you know, I have a really difficult time accepting compliments. And, and it's very difficult to overcome. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully overcome it. And it's tough. Uh, according to a recent survey by Ambitious about Autism's Youth Council, 75% of individuals with autism spectrum disorder have experienced bullying in their lifetime, while by comparison, only about half of all young people have said they feel safe at home, at school. The reason for this is due to the way the neurons in their brain fire, leading to problems understanding social situations and demonstrating behaviors such as stimming, which is a way for individuals with neurodivergence to self-comfort. In an article published by the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, childhood bullying, particularly in elementary school, may increase the risk of developing BPD, 
which ordinarily can't officially be diagnosed until adulthood. Uh, according to the study of 6,050 mothers and their children, individuals who were bullied between the ages of 8 and 10 years old and higher risk developing borderline personality disorder. Chronic bullying during childhood, particularly between the ages of 8 and 10 years old, lead to a five times higher risk of developing BPD than in children who weren't bullied and children who experienced both physical and psychological bullying more than seven times more likely to develop BPD in adulthood. Let that sink in for a minute. Borderline personality disorder, like most personality disorders, can't typically be diagnosed until after the age of 25, once the brain fully develops. To shame somebody for blaming who they are now on their past, is just adding to that bullying. We cannot control how our brains respond to trauma. We cannot control how our brains develop, how we develop as human beings. We can do our best to push it in certain directions, but regardless, the experiences we encounter throughout childhood and young adulthood affects our personality permanently. In a study of 48 perpetrators of school shootings performed by Peter Lang Langman, PhD, 40% of those studied were victims of bullying, which was 19.2. In the same study, it was found that 54% of the perpetrators bullied others, 25.92 people. However, this isn't to say that all bullies will become school shooters. In fact, the study found that 94% of the perpetrators that bullied others were psychopathic. Um, there is no actual diagnosis of psychopathy or sociopathy. Uh, generally, it's diagnosed as antisocial personality disorder. 48% uh, were psychotic, exhibiting a detachment from reality, and 17% were traumatized. Bullying also varied across the populations of shooters in the study. Research found that even though it was not a recent trigger for violence, the suffering endured in childhood may have left deep scars and lingering rage. According to the study, college-age shooters were the least likely to experience bullying, 23%, but were also the most likely to bully others, 83%. 45% of shooters were aberrant adults who were bullied with 36% of shooters being aberrant adults who bullied others. The highest was the 54% who suffered bullying in secondary school, with 50% bullying in secondary school. Uh, this was from Langman, uh, 2014, Statistics on Bullying and School Shooters. I've, I've got more information here. I'll copy and paste this into the uh, description, let you guys read it. But, yeah, I just wanted to spend the last hour talking about bullying, advocating against bullying. Um, one of my favorite t-shirts now is this Stop Bullying t-shirt, um, Stop Bullying wristbands. I, I bought about 200 of these wristbands because I see myself as a an advocate against bullying. Um, I even had a shirt that it was like this, um, but it was a little tight in the shoulders, so I turned it into a tank top to wear in the gym. Uh, I've got another one that's just black and white. But being an advocate against bullying not just as a mental health professional, but as a parent and a substitute teacher is a huge part of my personality. It's a huge part of who I am now. Um, I Now that I've been able to understand how bullying affected me, not only as a child, but as an adult, It's 
brought me to a place where I don't want to see that happen to anyone else. So I strongly encourage you to educate yourselves on the effect, the impact of bullying, to educate your children on the impact of bullying, your students on the impact of bullying. And let's bring an end to this crisis in our country, in our world. Um, bullying doesn't help anyone. In fact, it does the opposite.